Susan Lieberman is Vice President for International Policy with the Wildlife Conservation Society. She joins us today to discuss illegal wildlife trade. Susan, thanks for joining us. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Let me ask you first about the scope of the problem. Uh, how large of a problem are we talking about, and, and where are the most endangered species located? Well, it's hard to get an actual figure on the illegal wildlife trade. Like any illegal trade, it's very hard to know exactly. Not submitting their tax returns. No, exactly. They're not reporting. Based on what governments are are seizing and, and prosecutions, we think it's worth between 20, 10 and $20 billion a year. It's a massive illegal trade. But, of course, that's including illegal fisheries trade, illegal timber trade, illegal logging. But if you just look at what you might think of more wildlife, mm -hmm. elephants, rhinos, tigers. It is massive, and for many species, it is the number one threat to their continued existence. And the illegal trade, the poaching, the trafficking, the involvement of organized crime in a lot of countries, particularly in Africa and Asia, threatens the species, but also threatens people and their very security. So it is a big problem. And fortunately, we're seeing governments paying more attention and seeing this because it is up there with weapons trafficking, human trafficking, and guns trafficking as a significant uh, crime. Is it, is, as far as trend lines, is this a growth industry? Is Unfortunately, the it's, it's growing. Mm. It's growing for a number of reasons. It has grown, but it's one of those, unlike some other trafficking, um, it's not because I work on it, but I do think it's something that we can stop because although it's growing, it's not... Um, it's not so out of control that it can't be controlled, but it's certainly growing for a number of reasons, including improved transport routes. It's much easier to fly or ship from point A to point B in Africa, Asia, Latin America than it ever was. And the, uh, the growing economies of, of Asia. I am thrilled that there is a growing middle class in China. I'd rather they not buy endangered wildlife with their money. Speaking of these trade routes, uh, yeah, and often people associate this problem with the developing world. And in anticipation of speaking with you, I did a little research, and I see that Europe, the EU, is a major uh, trade hub for a lot of the trafficking that goes on. So this isn't as simple as, as some impoverished areas of the world. Absolutely not. Of course, some of the developing countries, some of the poorest countries of the world, have some of the best biodiversity, the best wildlife. So they become the sources for the wildlife that is traded illegally, but is a global problem. It's a problem for these countries, the range countries, but it's a problem for transit countries, and it's a problem for importing countries. And the U.S. and the, and the EU are not off the hook here at all. They're both transit countries and importing countries countries for legal and illegal wildlife. I don't want to say that any wildlife products that you may see are all illegal. They're not. But certain species that are endangered, any products, whether are in international trade, are going to be illegal. And it's something that there's no country, very few countries are exempt. Often a debate when you talk about drug trafficking is okay. whether it's the source or it's the demand side, which you need to focus on. In right. this case, do you have a luxury of saying one is a better no. place for focus? Or There's is it no both? luxury. Um, of course, in the drug trade, the harm is to the user, but it's an unlimited supply. In the wildlife trade, the harm is to the supply. There's no harm to the user for buying ivory. So it's very different, but we have a, limited, a, a very limited supply. And for species that are, that are declining rapidly, such as the African elephant that has been hit very heavily by poaching, sometimes the price will spiral when the supply goes down. So you'll have other traffickers involved because they're going to buy as a hedge against extinction. We're seeing that with the rhino horn right now, and, it's, and it is really a, a significant issue. It's not a simple supply and demand at all. Who, who are the consumers? And in some cases, you think of things like uh, whales, where there has been a uh, um, uh, uh, a cultural barrier in Japan, a different standard for right. in ingesting whales uh, right. versus other parts of the, of the world. Uh, but are these, are these rich people who want exotic things? Who, no, who are these both. users? If you take the ivory trade, um, there, there are really two kinds of consumers. And one is the casual consumer who might buy ivory as a bangle, as a necklace, something, a little decoration. Maybe they'll go on vacation to Africa and they'll buy a carving. But there are also high-end consumers who will buy speculators. We've, the Wildlife Conservation Society has done some recent studies in China, the world's largest consumer, and it's both these low end, more low-end consumers, but a big market of speculators. Sort of investor, something Investors, rare, they're buying, like oh. people who would invest rare in gold, artwork. art, it's the same thing. Hmm. And therefore, they're investing, thinking the, the, that the species will decline to the point that their investment will be worth more. And that's what 
we have to target is that side of, of the market. And that's not a simple, a lot of conservation groups who are good hearted think, well, if only everyone understood how much, you know, how wonderful elephants are in the wild, if only we raised people's awareness, they wouldn't buy these things. That will influence some consumers, but not Might a speculator. Others, but not a speculator, yeah, right. exactly. So as far as the pushback or the potential solutions, organizations like yours, when you, when you look at the scope of the problem, and then you look at the pushback. Right. Is it equivalent? Is it big enough to address the problem? I think there's, there are really three ways to deal with the problem. One, and like any crime, first of all, you want to do crime prevention. So it, we have to stop the killing, stop the poaching. And we have to work with the governments in range countries to build their capacity to do anti-poaching, rangers on the ground. A lot of these countries are completely outgunned by the, by the poaching gangs. I mean, rangers don't have equipment, don't have, don't have vehicles, et cetera. So we have to work on the anti-poaching. We have to work on the trafficking, the sort of the laundering, the trafficking from the bush in Africa to the ports, getting out the corruption along the way. And we have to work on the end markets, whether here in the U.S., Europe, China, Japan, everywhere in the world. And working on markets means both working with consumers and regulations and laws. So is we there, have to do all of them. We have no luxury to choose one. Is there enough uh, leadership or coordination in the response? You know, among governments, we're seeing a significant increase in leadership. Is there enough coordination? Probably not. Is there enough funding? Never. Never. But I think we're seeing improved leadership and improved coordination of tackling the problem. And we're seeing, um, you know, I always think that the greatest problem is a lack of political will. And we're seeing in a number of countries significant political will, including in China, I, I, I have to say. China announced just last December, the end of the year, that they will completely close their domestic ivory market to all ivory sales by the end of 2017. That was a big move. That's a lot of political will. And I think you're seeing that in the U.S. and EU as well, and in a large number of African countries as well. Are there champions in the U.S. Congress? Uh, there are a number of champions in the U.S. Congress, and this has been, always has been a, a, a nonpartisan or bipartisan issue. I mean, no one's in favor of illegal wildlife trade, right. you know. But how we deal with it, there are champions in Congress. The last session of Congress, the End Wildlife Trafficking Act was, was passed, which, uh, places greater priority in the United States on this. The Obama administration issued an executive order that we're hoping is was completely, I, we know, I know it was bipartisan, we're hoping it continues. And the U.S. has shown a lot of global leadership on this. We're hoping that, I have no reason to think it won't continue. What about within the United Nations? Is this on the radar screen in a significant way? This is on the radar screen. There was a United Nations resolution, et cetera, on the issue. And it sounds like, well, that's pretty boring. The U.N. passes resolutions, but this was the first time a couple years ago the UN actually took up the issue of wildlife trafficking as a conservation issue and a security issue. The UN Office of Drugs and Organized Crime, which is a very important UN program, has now taken on wildlife trafficking as well. If you told me 10 years ago that they would have done that, I would have said, no way. They're doing drugs, they're doing weapons, but they realize that these crimes and some of the trade routes even, such as from Africa to Asia or Latin America to Asia, are really, really connected. And CITES, the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, not a UN treaty, but it's administered by, by the UN, is also engaging very actively. So yes. Does, does popular culture help move the needle at all? I, I'm thinking of these recent Disney releases, theatrical releases, a new one I, I see trailers for about wildlife in China. Right. Does, does this help? I'm sure it helps. I mean, I think popular culture like that will help people become more aware and then get in touch with their political leaders. I don't think it necessarily will help. Suddenly people will watch a movie and think, well, okay, I won't buy ivory uh -huh. or I won't buy endangered reptile leathers or I won't eat endangered species. Consumption as food of endangered species is a big problem in Asia, for example. But I think it does particularly for a younger population, millennials, whatever, those who are on the internet, it does make a difference. And they tweet, whatever, all about it. I think it, it, it helps. It can Everything. hurt, right? It, awareness, it, it, increasing awareness can't hurt. Nothing, it does, it uh, never hurts. Yeah. Uh, final thought, Susan, is for people who are more interested in these issues, where, what are the best resources? Where can they learn more? Well, they can learn more from our website. I have to say that, wcs.org, Wildlife Conservation Society, other conservation organizations in the United States, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service leads on this issue, and so an issue has a good website on it. 
Uh, CITES, the convention, has a good website on it. There's a number of places that people can go kind of to get more information on the issue. And what they can do about it is, when in doubt, don't buy something that might be a little dodgy. It sounds simple, but it does make a difference. Every, every little bit helps. Huh? Absolutely. Well, Susan Lieberman, thank you very much for joining us today, and thanks for uh, fighting the good fight. Okay, my pleasure. Thank you.